we use two forms of cognition. One kind of cognition is called cold cognition. And that's usually what we think about. So that's attention, memory, that everyday types of things. It's, it's really non-emotional cognition. So an example of it would be, you know, when you're planning your day at work, um, how do you organize a day so it's the most efficient day for you? So you think about, okay, I have to get through this, 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 and this. Now, what order should I do them in? And maybe what's the most important thing to do? And, and that's cold cognition. And it's also cold decision-making when you think about it because you have to make decisions about, you know, how you're going to structure your day. And that's what we're usually used to. But there's another form of cognition called hot cognition. And that's emotional cognition or social cognition. And it's also the type of cognition that involves uh, a, a conflict between risk and reward. So you have to make decisions that are risky and where you stand a lot to gain, but also you might lose a lot. And frequently when I'm talking to my students about hot cognition, I say it's a kind of cognition where suppose you're a student at university and all your friends have just finished their exams and they're about to go out to the pub to celebrate. And one of them says to you, look, I know you've got one exam left to do tomorrow morning, but why don't you come out with us anyway and celebrate because you're nearly done. And by the way, we've got uh, this this lady that you'd like to meet is coming out with us. So come and join us at the pub and, and celebrate. And then you have to make a decision quite quickly. Are you going to join your friends or are you going to do the right thing and stay, uh, maybe um, study for your exam the next morning and get a good night's sleep so you've um, consolidated all your memories for that, uh, for that studying that you've done. And, and you feel fresh when you go into the exam. So you've got a, a lot to gain because it would be great fun to go out with your friends and you might also meet this person you've been interested in meeting, but a lot to lose because it's actually your future. If you don't get a good exam mark, you know, if you don't do well on the exam, it could affect uh, outcome in the future too. So that kind of decision-making is called hot decision-making. So for most of us, the hot and cold cognition is very well balanced, but we can find that there's problems uh, in different neuropsychiatric disorders such as mania, for instance, or in neurodegenerative conditions like frontal dementia, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But I first wanted to make the point is that the interesting thing is that if you put healthy people in a scanner and um, you do a functional MRI study and you look at their brain scans, what happens is that if you ask them to do a cold decision-making task in the scanner, you see this neural network in the brain activated, which includes the area called dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Interestingly, um, if you put them in the scanner and ask them to do a hot cognitive task, maybe a risky decision-making task like the Cambridge Gamble task, what you find is that it activates a different neurocircuitry in the brain, again, including an area of frontal cortex, but this time it's orbital frontal cortex that gets activated. So you can see a different neural network in two, in two sort of different neural networks for this hot decision-making versus the cold decision-making. So the interesting thing is when we put people in the scanner and we might ask them to do a um, cold decision-making task, so perhaps they have to decide on uh, whether or not how many moves it might take to, to do a particular problem, and it's a cold decision-making task, what we find is that it activates the circuit in the brain, which includes an area in the brain called dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Now, in contrast, if we ask them to do, say, the Cantab Cambridge gambling task, which is a risky decision-making task, what we find is it activates a different neurocircuitry in the brain, and this involves an area called orbital frontal cortex, which is kind of behind the eyes. So these two types of decision actually activate different neurocircuitry in the brain. Now, what we found is that in patient groups, you can actually find that there's a dissociation between this. So that if you have, say, brain injury in dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, you can find that they're okay with their hot decision making, but they can't do their cold decision making. Whereas, say, if you take 
people with um, frontal dementia, which affects the orbital frontal cortex, you can see that they're very poor at making these risky decisions. And we know that they're, this um, manifests itself in their daily living because they, they do risky things and, um, and, and they have personality changes. And you can see that they're uh, affected in their risky decision making, but their cold decision making is still intact. Now, I've also looked at this in a different uh, type of uh, area because I've been interested in what makes for a good entrepreneurial brain. Um, what, how do entrepreneurs think differently from the rest of us? So in this study, which I published in Nature, we looked at entrepreneurs and compared them with high-level managers because we thought that was a good comparison group. So the entrepreneurs had to have started up at least two companies and they were from the um, what we call the Cambridge um, Silicon Fen. And uh, so we have a, a cluster here of high technology clusters, so we're able to get entrepreneurs. And they had to have started up two companies, and they had to have been regarded by their peers as entrepreneurs. And then we took another group, which is high-level managers who had never started any companies up before, but were at the same age and, and ability as these entrepreneurs in general, so the same sort of IQ and age. And we compared them on a number of tasks. And what we found was that on the cold decision-making task, entrepreneurs and managers were just as good as each other. But on the hot decision-making tasks, we found these differences came out. And so the interesting thing was, these people, the entrepreneurs and managers, were about 50 years of age on average. But we found that the entrepreneurs were showing risky sort of betting behavior on these hot decision-making tasks at the level of 21 to 27-year-olds. So they were very risky. But this was combined with a, when we measured their ability to problem solve flexibly, how good were they when they got stuck in a problem of quickly changing to a new solution so that they could solve the problem. They were very fast at this. So this risky decision making was combined with cold, good cold cognitive planning, but also with an ability to problem solve really rapidly. When we looked at the managers, we found that when they couldn't solve the problem on the first occasion, they couldn't switch like the entrepreneurs could. They weren't that cognitively flexible that they could switch. They got a bit stuck. They kept trying to do the same solution again and again and again. So this is the way we can find out these interesting differences between how people are, are, are superior at cold and hot cognition. And this is very important, for instance, for people who are, say, venture capitalists, because you can just imagine that when you are a venture capitalist and you're trying to decide, where should I put my money, I could risk all this money and I could gain a lot, but I could lose this money. You have to evaluate business plans and that's cold decision making. You have to say, you know, what are they making? Uh, where are they going to make it? Have they done the most optimal um, costing for all these pieces to make the parts and, and that sort of thing. And that's an all a cold business plan that you're evaluating. But then when you meet people, and you actually ask them questions and you probe. And so when the difference is that when we then, the venture capitalist then comes into a situation where he has to evaluate who he's going to give the money to or who he or she is going to give the money to, they have to decide, does this person really know what they're doing? And that's more of a hot decision-making process. And there you have to um, you know, ask questions and then you determine whether somebody really knows what they're talking about. It's almost like a gut sensation. And you can imagine that this kind of hot cognition is very important for us to read other people. It's the kind of cognition required for theory of mind that you would, we can have a good discussion with somebody because we know we can read them. We can know when they're getting disinterested or getting bored. And this is something that, of course, in certain neuropsychiatric disorders like Asperger's syndrome or autism spectrum disorder, people have trouble with. They can't read other people's minds. They can't understand the emotional and social context that they're dealing with. We need to know more about how hot and cold cognition interact with each other and why we might bias ourselves towards one rather than the other because we often have to make these decisions. So, for instance, in our everyday lives, you might 
be offered a job promotion and you get more money, you get more status, it seems really good, but maybe you have to move somewhere. So you have to leave your friends and family. And that's, uh, of course, got an emotional and social context to it. So then we have to figure out how do we bias these different decisions and how can we get the most, how can we make the most optimal decisions? So we want to make sure that our decisions are the best that they can be. And that requires both a nice combination of hot and cold. And we can see in neuropsychiatric disorders and brain injury, when this goes badly wrong, um, how poor our decisions can, can be. So for instance, somebody with mania, um, where they have problems in hot decision-making, risky decisions. They may max their credit cards so they go and spend everything, or they may put themselves in circumstances where it's very dangerous because they start talking to people randomly who they don't really know what they're like and maybe go out with them and they don't really have any background for knowing who, who these people are. So you can make um, unfortunate and dangerous risky decisions or ones that affect your economy and so forth if you, um, if you don't have it well in balance. So we need to know more about how to keep that in balance and we need to know what mechanisms, what drugs will help us treat these sorts of disorders in neuropsychiatric disorders, brain injury, where these things get out of balance. And we have some good evidence for the cold cognition but we have less evidence for hot cognition. Although we recently had done a study with uh, patients with schizophrenia where we asked them to um, recognize facial expressions. So they had to say, is that a happy face? Is that a sad face? That type of thing. And what we did find is that when we added on modafinil to their antipsychotic medication, we did get improvements and their ability to recognize these emotional faces. So it did seem that there may be ways that we can improve this hot cognition processes through drugs as well. What we don't know is other things about what, what might be the difference between somebody who gambles and somebody who's an entrepreneur. I mean, both of them are taking risks, obviously. But part of it is that you have to make good quality decisions. And this is probably the difference between these two groups. Because entrepreneurs are very good at making good quality decisions, but gamblers are probably not. So this is something that my colleague Luke Clark works on, and he's found that frequently they uh, get into a kind of superstitious behavior. Um, something occurs or co-occurs, like they have what's called a near miss when they're playing a, maybe a one-armed bandit, where almost everything comes up, but not everything comes up. And then they think, oh, I'm onto something. You know, so they make these inferences, which they really shouldn't make, because of course it's all chance. and. Um, Obviously, entrepreneurs are quite different in the sense that they, uh, first of all, they have good cold um, decision making. So they've evaluated very carefully when they're going to, you know, make a decision about a business or go into some area. So it's their cold decision making is very good, and that's only that they have the ability to uh, also make uh, what we call functional impulsivity. So they, they may have uh, decide that oh. I think this is a good area to go into, but it's actually based on the fact that they know they have a time-limited option and they actually have evaluated the background to this. So they're making quite good quality decisions along with uh, obviously having some risk tolerance. They're able to tolerate the risk of doing that. And that's really the difference between gamblers because the gamblers are probably not making the good quality decisions and they're not, um, and possibly they're also they're cold planning. They haven't looked at what they're doing uh, and calculated very carefully um, the risks of what they're doing either.